Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as a uh, natural products chemist, I appreciate the uh, and look forward to the talk tomorrow about uh, the use, the further use of that technique. And, and uh, you know, it's uh, very nicely done. I, I, I'm going to change uh, a little bit and I'm going to bring this uh, to uh, metabolomics and uh, a human application. And my role today is actually, uh, they didn't tell me, so I, I chose my own role. My, uh, I chose the role that I would try and um, talk about the, prob the promises and the problems and, um, and, and discuss what I think, you know, metabolomics can and should do and will do, um, I'm firmly convinced. Uh, I always have to make a disclosure. Uh, I was uh, the technical founder to Metabolon. I haven't had anything to do with the company since about 2006. I've lost all my shares and so, you know, I mean, I, I have to say it anyway. I'm an, an inventor, technical inventor. The work I'll, one of the works I'll discuss is um, the discovery of sarcosine uh, to illustrate the problems um, as well as the success. Um, I have no interest in that patent. Um, and I am an inventor of uh, Eroa. And I will talk about Eroa because I do believe that it holds uh, some uh, promise for uh, future work. And so that's the overview. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the Sarcosine work and then, um, and then about where Eroa could have done things uh, differently. Um, the uh, realm of metabolomics, you're going to see a thousand copies of variations on this slide. You know, the bottom line is uh, the genome is, is huge. You know, our human genome, 25,000 genes, uh, our tra those 25,000 genes give rise to 100,000 transcripts. Plants are even worse. You know, a hexaploid wheat, you're talking huge <laughs> numbers. But, you know, us simple humans, you know, 100,000 transcripts is a big number. Um, this gives rise to over a million different um, protein states. The remarkable thing is that if you're talking about, you know, the, thi the actual metabolic pools, the number of metabolic pools we need to maintain in order to build all of that stuff is relatively small. You know, maybe 1,800 to 2,000 molecules, and then you create, you know, this polymeric world that, you know, the genome, the transcriptome, and the proteome are only part of the lipidome and other ohms are, um, you know, large, large numbers. But that 1,800 molecules is relatively concise, it's relatively easy to measure, it's relatively easy to define. And because of that, if we can look at it and we can use it to our advantage, we can understand a lot of physiological state. There's two forms of um, metabolomics that are, are relatively common, unbiased metabolomics, in an unbiased metabolomic analysis, you look for anything and everything you can see. You know, as, um, as chemists or, or mass spectroscopists or NMR spectroscopists, we know what a peak looks like. We know the characteristics of a peak. And so we can chase peaks down into the noise. We can f deduce what's going on, even if we don't necessarily know what the compound is. That's the realm of the unbiased metabolomics. Um, and there's also the targeted metabolomics where you actually know, you know, that you are looking for specific compounds, high sensitivity on those compounds, and the ability to be very precise in the final quantitation in a targeted analysis is sometimes huge. And there are techniques out there that will let you um, find, you know, uh, 184 specific compounds. The, the key compounds in metabolites in, in, uh, in a, an organism, you know, that are cheap, clean, easy, fast. So it, there's a lot of ways to do a targeted analysis gives you a lot of information. There's also the unbiased forms which are more difficult to deal with, but um, I'll show you there's other ways. I personally am, am going to move, uh, I use mass specs and always have in my platforms because of their sensitivity. You know, I'm looking for lots of compounds. I want to really understand the total scope. So I've, I've ended up using um, uh, LC and GC um, both. 
um, and, and mass spec, huge sensitivity. And I, I just should point out that it's people forget, but it's really, really critical to have you know authentic standards so that you you know it, it, when you call something, I'll show you a slide later on. If all you have is the mass, um, you really don't know what the compound is. Um, you know, but uh, I mean, uh, even at very high resolutions, you you know what the formula may be. You can come close to it, but um, but you know, so uh, you really need those libraries. The problems that we've got in the unbiased world is too many unknowns. You know, better than the best studies out there. Uh, you know, Fien in um, I, I don't know 2008 or so published a paper in which he was able to name almost 50% of the compounds that he found. Very few people achieve even close to that. Most of the time, you're looking at people who are, you know, identifying, you know, somewhere between uh, 10 and maybe 30% of the compounds in a mixture. The, rem the remainder are unknowns, and they're unknowns on any number of levels, and so, you know, that's a real problem. Noise, chemical artifacts, I will uh, um, show you, uh, uh, you know, in situations where, you know, I, I would actually, I've argued that uh, maybe 80 to 90 percent of the peaks in a mass spec are noise, are artifacts. They're coming in from the solvents, they're, um, you know, it's stray electronic noise, um, and even though we know the characteristics of a peak, um, the, and these things may look like real peaks. They're not biological compounds, but they end up getting quantitated. Um, it's a real problem. Sample to sample variance during the analytical process, sample prep. Um, you lose 5% of, you know, one sample because, you know, you either let it sit on the bench for an extra five minutes or you let it get exposed to light or it gets, you know, it, or, or you, you know, pull out a homogenizer you know, that contains an extra drop of fluid and you only have, you know, 400 microliters of that so solution. So it's easy to introduce sample to sample variants and suppression, you know, the technical problems in a mass spec, when you are running an unbiased analysis, you're pushing lots of compounds through um, a generally, uh, you know, um, it's not baseline to baseline separation because you can't do it. And so you end up getting more than one compound in any given peak, and therefore some compounds are going to ionize with greater or lesser efficiency, and that makes quantitation a real problem. So, you know, th those are the problems. Now, let me just show you the study. The study was one um, uh, in which we looked at prostate tissues. There were other studies, and they've now been published, uh, looking at the uh, plasma and post-DRE urine, uh, but the study I'm going to talk about will be the uh, prostate tissue study. <coughs> there were three classes of tissues, uh, benign low-grade tumors and, um, and high-grade PCAs. A high-grade PCA is a metastatic tumor. Uh, it's a tumor that's gone wild and was collected from another site. Um, they did, in addition to the metabolomic work, uh, complete genomic and proteomic um, workup, and those were also published separately so that we um, had characterized, it, it had been characterized, these tissues had been characterized quite conclusively before we began, but we then sat down and looked at the metabolomics, and, and th this was funded by the uh, EDRN from the NCI and the publication, and that will show up in a couple of these slides, so you don't have to grab it now, but it was uh, Nature in 2009. Um, the overall results, uh, we ultimately found in an unbiased analysis 1,265 compounds across the, all three of the tissue types, um, that the, uh, the urine, the, the, uh, um, the plasma and the, um, and the tissue. Uh, we found within the tissues alone, we found 262, uh, uh, uh clinical samples, uh, or I'm sorry, those were across all of the tissue types. 262 samples gave us 1,200 compounds, um, and those were only the best. The um, no big surprise, I show this only because sometimes people 
have never seen anything, see it, seen it before. The fact of the matter is plasma is chemically very different from tissues, is very different from urine. You know, the fact of the matter is you would never expect their chemistries to be identical. Some people do use the same libraries on everything, and y you just have to be aware that that's, that's an assumption that's just not true. Within, within only the tissue, we did identify uh, 626 compounds, and within the, um, the three different types of tissues, 515 of those, of those 626, in other words, the vast majority, showed up in all the tissues. And they weren't statistically, s uh, they were in some cases statistically significant, but they, they, were, they were common. But look at this, you know, in three different classes of tissues, we actually had compounds that were unique to each of those groups. And so from the outset, we actually knew that we had a pretty good study. And um, then when we, ac we built a heat map of the entire data set, all 626 compounds, um, you know, you could see it. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, so again, the trick was not were these things different, but how to figure out how to handle the data. And, and um, so, you know, there's the heat map. You can see they're different. We can see they're different. Hierarchical cluster analysis um, gave us a uh, reasonable separation where it made mistakes. Um, those were, in fact, questionable samples, but it didn't make mistakes in the, uh, in the um, metastatic samples. So, and that's really where we're going to go anyway. Um, my favorite technique is to compare everything to the benign to the normal. Um, so these are the z-score. Uh, how does the chemical concentration found in any sample deviate from the norm as seen in the control? And when you do that, you can actually see that the tumorous deviated significantly. Uh, that is out here. Some, some compounds being 20 to uh, 25 times more than the normal variance for that compound found in the control samples. Um, and then once you got to the metastatics, the biochemistry was tremendously deviant. Um, we sat down and we passed the compounds that were statistically significant against a wide range of, um, you know, metabolo m metabolic options. You know, is it this pathway? Is it that pathway? Was there one pathway that gave us an answer? And the answer is no. Every pathway was affected to some extent. You know, these cells were just, they had achieved a new state, and that new state was, um, um, w was co a completely new state. Uh, it was a new homeostasis. We sat down and did a technique um, shown here called molecular concepts mapping. And in molecular concepts mapping, you take the compounds and you associate them with tags, and then you see which tags show up across all of the statistically significant compounds. And when we did that, um, that was published in uh, Nature Genetics 39 in 2007, um, and is open source. Um, when we did that, we ended up with this illustration and I would draw your attention to everything in the red box, everything in the red box, you notice the word methyl shows up an awful lot. And even where the word methyl doesn't show up, let me clue you in, there, methyl is somehow related. So what became a quickly apparent was that methylation was, it was, a, um, was an ongoing issue within these cells, the, the metastatic cells. And so, you know, we took that and tried to scratch our heads tried to figure out what the uh, next step might be. And here are the metastatic samples compared to the tumorous, because at that point, the metastatics were the ones we were looking at. And one of the compounds that, hold on, one of the compounds shown here that was, you know, really very different, grossly different between these two groups was sarcosine. Sarcosine is N-methylglycine, and because it, it was methyl, we decided, okay, it fits what the data is. Let's look, investigate this, and we did. And, and um, so at this point, I would like to just point out that a potential biomarker we thought we had. And so 
the, the, the primary goal is identify a biomarker. A secondary goal would then be to help see if you can understand the biology. At this point, we now had what we thought might be a very interesting compound. And so we, um, so sarcosine is glycine and methylated by S adenosyl methionine, which gives rise to S adenosyl homocysteine, which breaks down to homocysteine and adenosine. And I've given you the little heat maps underneath each one of these. And you can see that I all of the heat maps actually um, showed patterns that were, you know, significant. Um, so we then sat down and revalidated um, using a much more sensitive assay, um, a GCMS targeted analysis, the same samples. And when the same samples were analyzed, th the data set came out, it repeated. It repeated quite well. Um, we've now continued this on um, literally um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of samples. Uh, this is an older slide, but the data set continues to play out well. So I think it's fair to say that sarcosine um, does appear to uh, be related to uh, the more aggressive states. Um, they then sat down, the University of Michigan lab sat down and looked at uh, a comparison of non-invasive cells to invasive cells um, in tissue culture. The non-invasive cells um, had very low sarcosine levels. The invasive cells all had high sarcosine levels. If they converted a cell type from one to the other by either knocking down or overexpressing EZH2, uh, when they knocked down a non-expressive, a non-invasive cell, or when they overexpressed in a non-invasive cell, Sar EZH2 so that it became invasive, all of a sudden sarcosine levels went up and they took an invasive cell and knocked down EZH2 and, and the sarcosine levels went down. So invasiveness, and, and that is what metastas metastasis really is, um, went down. So it really did appear that there was a relationship and they continued through with some very significant biology to prove that there was in fact, a relationship between sarcosine levels and the ability of a cell to, um, to invade um, or become motile, which is the hallmark of, of, uh, uh, of metastasis. So uh, did we find it in urines? It, 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 very poor signature, but people have done that and, and, and done it and, and found ways of teasing that signal out. So we did see huge metabolic alterations during prostate cancer progression. Um, this has now been seen in other places. It involved methylation. Um, sarcosine is a key metabolite, and uh, and you know it, it it appears that the biology of um, metastasis and sarcosine are somehow interrelated. Um, so, you know. People have gone on to look at sarcosine, and they considered this a very early success story for metabolomics. I would like to, at this point, point out that we followed up on one of 626 compounds. We only named 30% of those compounds, so we had about 400 plus compounds that we couldn't name. And many of the compounds we didn't follow up on are compounds that we had not a clue what they were. There's no way to follow up on something if you don't know it. So we were having problems naming things. We were having, um, you know, there was, even though the assay, when put into a very high performance analysis, reproduced itself, you know, we, we, there was a lot of noise in the initial assay that we had to overcome um, and all of those problems. And after, after we did that work, I started thinking about how to solve some of the problems. And this AROA protocol, um, you know, became sort of the thing that I started thinking about. So AROA is the isotopic ratio outlier analysis. Following up on the previous talk, another one of these uses of isotopic material to give you 
you know, stability and insight in, the, in making the measurements. Um, but it, and in this case, what we're doing is we're embedding additional chemical information into the mass spec signal. And so then, once we figured out a way to embed this additional information into the signal, then we just had to figure out how to read the information out on the other side. And so that's really all it is. And this is the information. This is a normal um, spectra. Uh, as this is a, a cartoon of a normal spectra for the compound arginine. Arginine has a normal mass of 175.1190, but because we live in a world where 1%, 1.1% 1 1 .1 of the uh, carbon is C13, there is always what is referred to as an M plus 1, and that peak, this is a 6-carbon molecule, that peak is a little over 6%, um, and, and, and frankly, it's too small to pay attention to, and most mass spectroscopists don't pay attention to it because it's usually in the noise. But um, there is always that peak. This is what we started thinking about. What if we changed that one? What if we lived in a world that was 5%? If, if we were at 5%, that peak would be at 31.6%. Um, uh, that peak, the M plus 2 would be significant. And, um, and furthermore, if we were in a world where 95%, in other words, the, the mirror image, all of the carbons now are C13 with a 5% doping of C12, you now get the reverse pattern. Those were M plus ones, these are M minus ones. The M minus one is also 31.6%. So the information that is carried on this M minus one, M minus two, that pattern, is what we were looking at. And the question is how re that pattern turns out to be mathematically very easy to follow. And look at this. If I have a system in which I have a 5% carbon peak, I know exactly how many carbons are in it because of that height. So I know where that peak should be. That I know the number of carbons because of the distance between the, the two monoisotopic peaks. I know the number of carbons from the height of that peak. I know the number of carbons. This is a triply redundant system. Every peak in it tells you, gives you information that you can use to find the other peaks. And so it was simply a matter of following through on the math and figuring out, you know, what we could do. Um, this is how you would run an experiment. You would have to label cells up so that all of the carbon in the cell um, carried those, isot those isotope patterns. A four carbon molecule would have the patterns for a four carbon molecule. A 27 carbon molecule would have the patterns for a 27 carbon molecule. But you could, you could figure it all out and it turns out it was software amenable. So, um, so you would grab one population of cells, split it in two, um, grow half the cells on uh, media that was 95% C13, half of the cells on, uh, on media that was 5% C13. The two media are chemically identical. After the cells have been allowed to grow out, you've effectively replaced all of the carbon. Therefore, every molecule is going to carry those patterns, and if you can interpret the patterns, you're going to do fine. If you take one of these populations, the 5% population, treat it as a, to some sort of experiment. You know, you hit it with a toxin, you, you know, shine a light on it, you um, give it water, and you leave the 95% as controls. Then uh, after the experiment's done, you pool the two samples, prep them as a single, and then um, look at the ratio of the C12 peaks to the C13 peaks, and if your control is all taken at the same time and all of the controls are identical, you have an internal standard in the C13 peak that you can measure everything against. You are picking up on the quantitation and you have now removed all of the error involved in sample prep. In other words, when you pull that homogenizer out and you lose 5% of the sample, you lose 5% of both samples, and because of that, there is no longer sample-to-sample -sample variance. Um, 
there is no longer analytical variance based on um, ion suppression, and I'll show you all of that later. So, so this, and, and you know, and because you've got an internal standard, your um, your numbers are really pretty good. Um, so the the key was really to write once we understood what the signal looked like to write a piece of software, and uh, it turned out to be the pattern is so mathematically approachable that we could write you know um, a, a very good piece of software that basically took all of the data points of a mass spec and in one single application reduced it to a list of of um, of uh, pure data points. Pair prediction, I showed you a second ago that um, a six carbon molecule, the height of the M plus one or the M minus one is 31.6 percent, a seven carbon molecule is 36 percent. This is a step function. The step function continues no matter how many carbons you've got. Um, at some point, the monoisotopic peak is dwarfed by the M plus one or the M minus one, but it's a pure step function that is mathematically predictable. You know what all of these things are going to look like, so you can always um, apply this. This is a simply the binomial expansion of the two um, isotopic balances. Um, this is what the signals look like for a five carbon molecule. And, um, you know, there's the M plus one, the M plus two, the M minus one, M minus two. We call this a smile because it, you know, it, it, I mean, you, you just get real used to seeing them. And the key here is that I had said that most of the s molecules in seen in the mass spec are artifacts. And I believe that only a biological molecule can show this. Artifacts are natural abundance, and since artifacts are natural abundance, they will never exhibit the M plus one, or certainly not an M minus one. So it's a very strong lockdown signal that is mathematically um, correctable. This is what your spectra look like. Everything is, dup every compound shows up twice, um, the control side and the experimental side, and um, and I should point out that, and I will point out again later, that if you know what the, the height, the ma exact mass of the monoisotopic peak is, and you know the number of carbons, it's got five carbons, the formula is a given. You ca that constrains the number of potential formula so that I it is an absolute given. You can never get the formula wrong. Um, you know, so it, it really helps a lot on the identification in ways that we never used to do it. But you can't label everything. So if you can't label everything, how do you handle that situation? Well, remember, I said that it was triply redundant. You actually are using the information in the C12 side, the C13 side, and if you, you can use that triple redundance when you only have one half of this, you still have enough information, plenty of information, to find that peak. So you know from the height of the M minus one that this is a six carbon molecule. And since you know it's a six carbon molecule and you know what the monoisotopic is, you subtract the mass of six neutrons, you know exactly where that peak should be. And if you find that peak where it should be, then in fact you know it is the mate and you um, compare the area under the curve. So in point of fact you can do this in a world where you, you, know, you can use it against natural abundance samples. The difference is, and, and this is what the signals really look like, um, um, the difference is the following. Um, basic Aroa is a fully untargeted or unbiased analysis. You will find something if it exists in, in either population because it's going to carry the sample, the, the signal. The, the phenotypic, the one I just showed you, is a targeted protocol. You will find every compound that is in your C13 control, and because you'll find every compound in your C13, which is hundreds, you'll get a, a good phenotypic analysis, a profile of, of that sample. Um, 
All right, I'm going to quickly go through the peaks. Um, this is what the peaks look like in a standard terminology. Monoisotopic peak is the, the, the pure C12. There's a C13 monoisotopic, the pure C13, and then they either have M plus ones, M plus twos, or M minus ones. And just to point out what I said a second ago, when you exceed at 5% uh, 20 carbons, then it's a step function, right? So since it's a step function, when you exceed 20 carbons, the M plus one is now a bigger peak. So it's no longer a smile, but it's still mathematically correct. Um, you know, and, and these, these forms are, y y we have a little calculator that just plugs them right out and it just pops out the patterns and, and knows exactly what to look for. Ion suppression um, is um, resolved. So uh, suppression is really a function of uh, chemical structure. So if you have a C12 and C13 and they're in exactly the same environment, they will both be suppressed to the same level. Therefore, the C12 the height, r uh, total area under the curve relative to the C13 will still reflect the original numbers irrespective of the percent ionization. So if you have a compound that is ionizing at 10%, and it's C13 is ionizing at 10%, the fact of the matter is you still know how much of the original material was in the uh, control and how much was in the experimental. Suppression is no longer an issue. Compound identification, um, as I said, uh, you plug in you know, the mass that you get in a mass spec into a formula generator. The correct formula, I know this is a 10 carbon molecule, the correct formula in this perfectly normal case um, was the uh, 13th formula that was that the formula generator gave me. Um, and the others, some of them are just foolish, but um, in the past I would have had to use them. Um, this is what I was referring to a second ago. If you have a mass and you calculate the number of potential formulae at that mass um, shown in red, without knowing the number of carbons, the number of formulas that, that formulae that you can have can become huge. Once you know the number of carbons, the number of formulae that you can, that could potentially be correct becomes remarkably smaller and below a mass of 450, it's effectively one. Um, there's a, a couple of other cute tricks we can play because you actually have two cell populations internal to one another. Um, you can take the total area under the curve for the um, one population and the other population and mathematically identify them and then normalize so that you always have the same size of the um, control population. And it, it's, sim it's a straightforward math, um, but it, 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 it allows you to uh, deal with sample sizes of the wrong side. I'm going to go through these real fast, um, but just, you know, in the old, in the old world, I used to um, know that a compound would show up, technically, I thought it would show up closer to B, and, you know, so my software would have selected B as the real compound. In point of fact, or it would have selected A as the real compound. It would have shown up as A, but, and, and there's the peak. Those two peaks have virtually the same mass to four decimal places. I think they're off by, you know, 0 0.0002. Um, but B is my real peak. I know that because that's a biological peak. That's an artifact. Um, it, it, once you can see what's an artifact and you realize how many peaks are artifacts, vast majority of peaks in a mass spec are artifacts. Um, even in a situation where these two compounds are, again, very close in their, their mass, but they have two, this is a five carbon molecule, this is a six carbon molecule. They're close enough that they're physically bleeding into the same peak, um, but it's pretty easy to see where my five carbon is and where my six carbon is. And um, so it, so it, anyway, it, that's, um, it's a very interesting technique. So tomorrow, I, so I, tomorrow they asked me to suggest a topic, and I, and and um, 
Tomorrow we're going to talk about some other techniques that use isotopes to help metabolomics. And I, I think you're going to see something very similar across the board. People are using isotopes to create internal standards to help give them precision, to give them additional pieces of information. You know, so I urge you to come tomorrow to the um, isotopic analysis session. I think you'll find it fascinating. I do believe that where you can apply these techniques, um, just like in the, er the earlier session where you could literally lay out a biochemical pathway for a secondary metabolite, these techniques are going to play a huge role in the future of metabolomics. So come tomorrow. Um, let me just point out that the, um, I of course didn't do any of the real work. Um, the real work was done either at the uh, University of Michigan uh, Metabolon. Um, the EROA work was done also at uh, University of Michigan or uh, NextGen uh, and HUPMET I didn't talk to you about. So I'd, with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Well, I think it's just one signal. So I, the, the question was, uh, and, and I'll ask you to correct the question if I get it wrong, um, but the, I, the question was, sarcosine does not appear to be common to all metastatic tumors, and is, you know, it, do, do we believe that, you know, is there an explanation for why that may or may not be true? So I think the key is to, it, my understanding of cancer is, I'm a chemist, but my understanding of cancer is that basically the cell becomes so genetically unstable that it begins turning on and off almost at random um, the genes that are, you know, core to its existence. And I think that for some reason in the prostate, when this gene is turned on, it induces a pathway that is not unique to prostate. My, my personal belief, and um, unsupported by any evidence, is that sarcosine is, is part of a, um, a, you know, a pathway that is involved in embryology. So if you think about you know, developmental sequences, very early developmental sequences, you actually have to cause things to move. And then once you've moved them, you really don't want them to move again. And so you shut those pathways off. For some reason, in the cells that we were looking at, it looks like that pathway was one of those random turn on. And it may be that in, um, you know, in other tumors, there are other movement type mechanisms. Grab the microphone if you, if you want to continue. But uh, so, so it, it, uh, you know, so my guess is that for some reason, prostate enjoys, um, uses that mechanism when it becomes metastatic. Other, there are other movements, you know, that, that are induced, other things, and, and my guess is a lot of these are going to turn out to be embryological mistakes that are never meant to be turned on in an adult. Per so wh what proportion of metabolites or artifacts, I mean, if you go back to a study like a, a I, I prostate study, what mm -hmm. is, if you look at a, a run, and then what are the percentage of metabolites that you actually see that are artifacts? So I've, I've grown even more skeptical of the data um, because in addition to um, artifacts, I now recognize that there's much more because I know that some co signals, so the in direct answer to your question, I believe the vast majority of the signals in a, um, in a mass spec are um, of limited uh, are not of biological origin yeah, and and the vast majority I, I mean I'm saying you know 80 in some cases 90 percent you know they plasticizers and whatnot ha having said that I will also say that there's a lot of bad biological data because of the um, mass spec interfaces now that now that I can prove that a compound is um, you know a a, a a peak is of biological origin because it contains an AROA signal. So I know that the cells made it. I still find signals that are very strange. And I believe what is going on here is, you know, it's fragmentation, you know, and secondary processes that are occurring in the mass spec interface. Now, those should theoretically 
all be highly correlated to their base peak because they can't, they can't occur if the base peak um, isn't present. So, so, you know, it seems to me that a simple correlation algorithm should help you identify those and, and help you remove them. So again, and we have talks um, about, you know, data pre-processing, you, know, uh, you know, all of this, you know, once you create the data set, it's critical to understand the answer to these things. I think there's, so most of the data is um, artifactual, even within the biological realm, a large part of it is dangerous. Uh, is that true for all kinds of, uh, of mass spectra, like from all the mass spec or for direct infusion, that so you eliminate any chromatographic separation? I, I, I think the, so the, the, so the, so the, 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 way, the, the way I used to get <laughs> around it and the way that most people get around it is they draw a cutoff. And they say, we're not going to look at signals below X. Yeah. And you know, they're going to say, any signal higher than X is likely to be real. And, and, and in that case, you are looking at true artifacts. You're probably, I'll ask the expert, um, the, but my, my guess is that at, at some point, you're, you're um, you know, at, that, at some point, you probably can reduce you know, the 80 to 90 percent by simply cutting off the very little peaks. You know, that's in the noise region. Um, surprisingly enough, AROA allows us to mine that noise region pretty, pretty well. You know, with reasonable mass resolution, you know, the probability of, you know, three peaks in a row being one neutron apart at the I same time is so rare that, um, you know, and, and then to have a pair of them at the same time, that it, it turns out we actually mine fairly freely down into that region and get highly reproducible data across multiple samples. But, but so most people handle it by doing the cutoff. And even then, um, you know, the things that are coming from your solvents, you know, you don't, they say you don't want to know about making sausage, you definitely don't want to know how they transported your solvents. Um, solvents are filthy. Um, you buy the best solvents in the world, um, unless you distill them yourself, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not so good. <laughs> um, you know, all the plastic wear, you know, every, everything you touch is going to, you know, is a potential source of an artifact. So I, I think people don't give enough credence to, you know, what percent of the, you know, I mean, I recently saw a very good person, a person I have huge respect for, you know, tell me, uh, t tell an audience that he was receiving 36,000 peaks from a single sample. And, y you know, I mean, uh, give me a break. <laughs> that's, you know, he, I, I, I don't believe that if he thinks about it, that that's even potentially real. I mean, Granted, cells are complex, but our limit of detection is not infinitely low.